Hello, my beautiful babies, and welcome to God Emperor Dune Club. Today, uh, from this copy of the book, we're going over pages 67 to 140. And um, let's see here. I think uh, the Duncans always begin that way. I think that is the end. The end of this session. Yes, the end of this session. So you want to read, if you're not reading from this book, read all the way to the Duncans always begin that way. So, uh, and also please excuse my sunglasses. I have an eye situation going on today. So, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're making it work. We're making it work. So let's dive right into it. Chapter nine, spies and rebels. So in this chapter, we get to sit in on a, a meeting of the rebels, Siona's rebels. They're in the bowels of the city of On, and you have this guy, Topri, and we met him last time, and he is performing the showing ritual with his fake plastic Chris knife. You know, he's, he's oh, you know, doing the fucking ritual for all the rebels and Siona is just so bored with this shit. She's so bored with this shit and she thinks back to when they bought their plastic Chris knife from what is known as a Museum Fremen. Now I love the concept of the Museum Fremen. Uh, even the title of it is so good. So Leto has kept Fremen culture alive and going in spite of the way that, you know, there's no need for it anymore. They, they live on a paradise planet, essentially. Uh, and the culture obviously has become very sad and degraded version. And these museum Fremen are people who f are forced to live in a sietch in the desert of his surreal, and they are aping the ancient Fremen ways for the benefit of tourists. I mean, they're kind of like a, a sideshow attraction for tourists. I think uh, Leto also gets a kick out of him. I, you know, I, it's really unclear why he's done this. Maybe he's kept the Museum Fremen around because possibly he knows that the Dune times shall come again and he wants to keep some thread of the old ways alive for the next generation to build off of, but it's really not clear. Um, so this Museum Fremen that they're buying the, um, their Chris knife off of, Tayshar, he's, he's no Fremen at all, you know, I mean, they're talking with this guy, this guy sucks, uh, and since these Museum Fremen are very, very tightly restricted by rules set forth by Leto, they have very little financial freedom, and Siona senses duplicity in this man, and she calls him out, and it manifests as him asking for double the originally agreed upon price for the duplicate Chris knife. And she tells him, once you have a marketplace soul, the souk is the totality of existence. You have the souk mentality. You know, she's just like, you're a fucking asshole. I love this. And it's like, again, it's like, oh, did 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 Leto make it to where the term souk, because the souk, you know, Dr. Yui was a, a souk doctor. Did he like change that term and turn it into this like, oh, you can be bought and sold thing? Like, which is like, what a burn, you know, where you're just like, oh, all you care about is buying and selling. All you care about is money. You know, like you're just, a, you're, you just care about money. It's like, oh, that's such a burn. Anyways, Siona is sitting there and she's thinking about their rebel alliance and how pathetic it is and just as pathetic as the museum for Fremen and the plastic Chris knife and she thinks to herself a copy is worse than nothing <laughs> so she's kind of really getting over it and once the introduction to the ceremony is over now it's time for a special guest we have Io Kobat who is the recently fired ex-ambassador of Ix to whom the laser gun used by the Duncan was traced to. And rather than being executed, he is being used as a messenger to the Ixians. Siona grills Kobat on the details of his dismissal. And she finds out, A, the Duncan is dead and that a new one is on the way. And B, that there is this Ixian deception going on in which they're cheating the guild and the Bene Gesserit out of spice through a false project to create a machine to fold space and time as the guild navigators do 
thereby freeing humanity from Leto's supreme spice monopoly, which restricts free travel among the human race. And she ferrets out that Leto knows about this, but he thinks it's funny. So he lets it go on because he knows it's such a farce. And Io is just like, no, no, it's real. No, we're, we're totally going to build this machine. And she's like, no, you're not. You're just cheating these motherfuckers. You know, it's really funny. Um, and she uses this leverage to force Kobat into smuggling copies of the stolen journals back to Ix for translation, which he really, he's already, you know, hanging on by a thread here. He really doesn't want to do anything else. But she's like, you know what? I'm not going to tell everyone that you're like running games on them. So you're just in return, you're going to take these stolen journals and you're going to shut the fuck up and you're going to do it. And uh, she tells him that she's also sent the journals to the guild and the Bene Gesserit to be translated. She also ferrets out that Topri uh, briefed Kobat on details of the rebellion before the meeting, told him about the, their belief in the oral histories versus the formal history, and that Siona is the leader, letting her know that Topri is a spy. So, uh, you know, and we found out that he is a spy, and so she's already figured that out. And, uh, and she also learns that there's a new ambassador from Ix, and the woman is named Hui Nuri, and she's a niece of the ex-ambassador named Malki. Uh, by the way, Malki is just such a fantastic side character. There's so little about him, but man, he is somebody who I would love to know more about. Last, she dismisses Topri from the rebellion, much like Leto dismisses Kobat instead of killing him to deliver a message to Leto. And I, I love how these two mirror each other. You know, Siona hates him so much, but then she's always kind of like mirroring him and like doing very similar things where it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, the Leto didn't kill Kobat. And she's like, I'm not going to kill Topri. I'm going to send him as a messenger. And she sends him as a message to Leto saying that she accepts his challenge. The challenge is that he allows the Atreides to play at rebellion, like Maneo, her dad, who used to be a rebel, but now he's like his number one right-hand man. Um, and, you know, the, the thing is, they always come around to him in the end, but that she will not become a part of his inner circle. So she's letting him know, you may let me be playing at being a rebel, but... I'm not going to come around like my dad did. <laughs> she's, she's the ultimate rebel. So let's move on to chapter 10. We have the interview with the ambassador. So inquisitors of Ix interview their candidate, uh, Hui Nuri, even though she's already been chosen and this whole thing is totally a farce. And they have set this up to fool Hui into thinking uh, that she's applying for this position or, or that she's been, you know, that she, there's other people and there might be somebody else. Um, they're keeping her in the dark and they're being like mocking dicks to her in this interview as well. And I mean, she believes that she's fucked up the interview. Like she even believes, like they're mocking her so bad that she's even like, hey, I'm sorry for wasting your time, guys. Like, I, I don't know about this uh, before they confirm her. And they're like, no, 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 you're ambassador. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. But yeah, they're definitely fucking with her heavy in this. And I love that uh, she asked some questions to them. Like, why would Leto give up his humanity? You know, she sees him. Like, she's already asking the right questions. And, you know, and these Inquisitors are like, well, you know, power and long life. And she's like, really? Would you, would you, would you live in a weird worm body for power and long life? Would you do that? No. So, I mean, that's not really a great answer, guys. Uh, and she wants to find out. You know, she's like, well, he's a prescient person. He must have seen something in the future. And I want to know what he saw in the future that made him make this terrible sacrifice. So she's already on the right track. You know, this lady, like, she's fucking quick. And um, the peop uh, the Inquisitors say, you make the tyrant appear a self selfless servant of the people. You know, what, what do you think? He's some good guy? And she's like... Was that not a prominent characteristic of his Atreides family? That was such a great clap back. You know, it's just like, well, isn't that Atreides? Their whole deal is being servants of the people. Like, get out of here. We also find out in this interview that Leto executed a bunch of historians, <laughs> which destroyed their works, which I love. And again, the Inquisitors were just like, He's just trying to bury the truth. He didn't want the. They're like they're doing this conspiracy theory shit. Like they had too much truth, and she's like, maybe, 
maybe guys instead of instead of they knew the truth maybe it's because these guys are full of shit and Leto knows it because who else would know? I mean, he's been around like he would know. Um, and also uh, she shares her her uncle Malky, who had uh, experiences being an ambassador to Leto. Uh, she shares his experiences and observations, um, which are pretty positive. You know, Malky says that Leto is an artful diplomat, a master conversationalist, an expert on everything capable of brutality but ultimately civilized who delights in surprising genius and diversity of humankind so that's that's the attitude that she's going in with uh becoming the new ambassador let's go on to which i love queen Marie though she's great i can't wait for you guys to meet her um so let's go to chapter 11 festival meeting gone awry <laughs> so time poor tired maneo poor tired maneo he's going to meet with leto in the crypt and he's going to talk to him about the peregrination to the festival city of on where a peregrination is like a long walk where you have the king and he's walking and all of his subjects are like following him and it's like this whole thing um, but they end up talking about everything but party planning so in this chapter, we learn a couple of fun facts, one of them being that Leto only requires a few hours of semi-repose a month, and that's enough sleep for him. He doesn't sleep every night. He just kind of kind of meditates a little bit for a few hours once a month, and then he's fine. And then fun fact number two, Maneo is 118 years old. He's still spry, though. I mean, he's still spry. He's older, but he's like, you know, I feel like he's, like more comparable to like a, a man in his like 50s or 60s who's in like really good shape and is like taking care of his body. Like I feel like that's kind of Maneo's sitch. And Maneo could live many times longer than that if he took the spice, but he doesn't want to because he has that curious human thing of longing for death, <laughs> which I, I love that Leto's like, I guess he just, that, that thing where humans long for death, you know, he's got it. And the only reason he's hanging on is to see Siona graduate, uh, be subverted from the rebellion and go into the Royal Society of Fish Speakers. I love that Malky calls uh, the fish speakers Leto's Huris. And Huris are beautiful young women, virgin companions of faithful Muslim men in paradise. So, you know, you hear of like the 70, the 72 virgins that you're promised if you're like, you know, a good Muslim boy and then you go to heaven, like that's like a, that's a Huri. Um, so that's what he calls his fish speakers, which is really cute. So they talk of the new Duncan. Maneo is concerned because he knows that Leto wants to mate a Duncan to his daughter and says, I find it peculiar to think of him as an ancestor and the father of my descendants, which is like, oh, what a fucking mind blower. You're like, okay, so this guy, I, I came from this guy, but then he's also going to have sex with my daughter and like be the father of my grandkids. Like, ugh, that's a little weird for me. It's a little weird. And Leto's like, you know what? It's fine. It's 21 generations removed. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Uh, Maneo really does not understand this breeding program. Uh, doesn't understand Leto. Again, calls himself a predator. Doesn't understand that comment. He's just at a loss. He's just so tired. He just, he can't, he can't keep up today. Um, and my interpretation, so he's talking, you know, Maneo and Leto are kind of going back and forth. And Leto's really kind of like fucking with him a little bit too, where he's just like, oh, you know, there's, like because he's like oh what are, you, what are you breeding for like what are what are we doing here and he's just like oh well you know uh, humans they you know what did i tell you about you know being able to make long-term decisions it's it's the ability to change your mind and like and then there's no laws but then there may be there's maybe there's one law and like Maneo's just like having a freak out he's like i don't get it like please can you just chill out and my interpretation of their conversation is um so he says, Huma humanity's ability to change their mind is the key to unlocking their ability to make long-term decisions. He says that laws tend to be temporary over the long haul. There is no such thing as law-governed creativity. Uh, and three, there's no law except maybe there is a law. Paradox. We love it. Uh, that short-term decisions 
fail in the long term. He's like, I'll tell you that, like, there's no laws, but if there was a law, it would be that short term decisions fail in the long term. And so what Leto is saying uh, from my perspective is that creativity is needed to survive in the long run. The ability to switch gears as things evolve. Um, that's what's like, you can't just like, I have a plan and we're sticking to this plan and that's what we're doing. Cause things change all the time and you have to switch gears and you have to be flexible enough to be and creative enough to be able to do something different on the drop of a dime if you have to. And I've seen this personally in internet culture. So on the internet, time moves much faster. You know, I was just thinking, I saw that, you know, the Area 51 raid was like two years ago. Uh, it just is the anniversary of the Area 51. It's like, wow, but it's like the, and the internet's just, it feels like 50 years on the internet since then. Um, but it's only been two years. And so on the internet, from my pers my experience uh, as being someone who has been a content creator on the internet for almost 10 years now, uh, getting locked into an idea or a plan is really no bueno. One of the things that I've seen over and over again is you have these big companies like, you know, Verizon Go 90 or like all of those MCNs uh, that we used to have, like t like full screen and like Machinima and Maker. And um, there's some other people too, I'm forgetting. But it's like, you know, they're, they had, they're, they're like so big and massive. And there's too many cooks in their kitchen. There's too many like laws that are being made. Like we have to do this, you know, like this is what we're doing and we have to do this. And like when things change on the internet and they change so quickly, these giant barges of, of people, these companies that are huge, they're just not, they're not able to, to turn as quickly when things change. And because of that, they end up failing and falling apart. Uh, and that, you know, for me, like I'm a little guy and I can turn on a dime if I need to. If I see like, oh, ad revenue, the ad apocalypse is coming. Oh, this is fucking, you know, like I can switch gears real quick and do something else. But if you have this giant company with, you know, investors and board meetings and this, that and the other and 20 different fucking managers, like they can't, they can't do that. And so they end up, you know, crashing and burning. And then I, you know, keep swimming along and I'm doing Dune Club 4, you know, so it's, it's real, it's real. To remain on the internet, you have to be creative and you have to like switch gears all of a sudden when like certain things just like stop working. Um, we also get to learn about worm sign. So Maneo, when he sees the worm approaching in Leto, the one that kills, you know, he talks about Leto doesn't kill, it's, it's the worm. There's like these body tremors that he starts having. He starts like twitching and his eyes like glaze over. He starts like glazing over and then his flippers start twitching, you know, these little twitchy flippers. And then like, that's how he knows that like the worm is coming and to just like back away. And there's a moment where he's like, Leto's getting annoyed with him because he's just like not getting it. And he's like, is the worm coming? He's like looking for the, looking for the twitch and he doesn't see it. And he's like, okay, I think he's okay. I think I'm not going to get smushed. And uh, Leto can just read Maneo like a book. I mean, it's almost like Maneo thinks it's like he's psychic or something because he can just read him so fucking openly. And Leto's like, all right, let's change topics. I see you want to talk about Siona. Uh, Siona's going to be tested soon. She's going to be tested. And this will be the big make or break thing of whether she's going to, you know, join up or whether she's going to probably die, you know, like we'll see. Uh, and will she be awakened to her duties as an Atreides and subverted from the rebellion as Maneo was? And Maneo's like, can we just not though? Like, do you have to test her? And I love Leto's response, which is, surely you did not ask me to delegate authority to a weak administrator. And he's like, oh, no, of course not. <laughs> but it's like, ah, I love like how he's just like, no, I don't give a shit. Like if she dies, she dies. Like we're, we gotta have strong administrators in this fucking government. And, uh, and then, you know, Meneo brings it back and says, well, uh, I hope she likes the new Duncan's company, you know, uh, uh you know, I'm not going to be a dick about her, about you trying to get her and Duncan together. And, um, and so, you know, he's getting ready to leave. Meneo's like getting ready to back out and he's telling, he's like, oh, I already got everything ready for you and the Duncan and everything's good to go. And like, everything's dialed in. And Leto says, sometimes I think you wish to weaken me, Maneo. Leave some details to me, you know. And that harkens back to the quote earlier in the book, enemies strengthen you, allies 
weak in you. So he can depend. Mineo is so dependable, he's too dependable, and that he's going to make Leto slip, which I think was really interesting. Um, so let's go on. Oh, hey, Quinn. Good to see you. Uh, let's go move on to chapter 12, the Welbreck Abridgment. This is a really fun chapter where we just kind of get this State of the Imperium report by the Bene Gesserit. It is in the year 3,508 of Leto's reign. So we finally get, you know, of course, like everyone's like, I don't know, it's been like 3,000 years. We don't know. But of course, the Bene Gesserit have been keeping tabs. And they're like, it's year 3,508 of his reign. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, we finally get to hear more about the historians that were burned. Uh, there was nine total, and they were in fact rendered unconscious before being burned alive on pyres of their own published works. How brutal, like that's, I don't know, I just think that's really funny and like fucked up. Um, and he re and I love that Leto goes in and, and reassures other historians. He's like, hey, if you made a mistake, in your history like that's fine i'm not gonna burn you alive i don't like making martyrs drama is one of the targets of my predation i'm trying to get drama out of i'm trying to breed drama out of humanity you know because drama is going to happen from the universe we don't have to create it ourselves um so if you you know if you slip up it's fine just don't write blatant fucking bullshit and then be like proud of it you know like just don't don't do that um and then we get to hear about sister Chenoa, she was invited to trot beside the royal cart and talk with Leto during the peregrination to On. So we do find out that the peregrination to On goes, pops off. And he uses her as a messenger to the Bene Gesserit. And she says that he was like a reverend mother. She could hide nothing from him, such as the Bene Gesserit's trying to suborn the fish speakers, uh, you know, and be like, hey, you guys kind of want to work for us? And the fish speakers are like, no, <laughs> no. And Leto, the main thing that he tells her is that he intends to restore the outward view. Such a landscape as this turns one inward in search of whatever freedom your spirit can find within. But most humans are not strong enough to find freedom within. He also mentions that Siona is to his breeding program as what Leto is to the Bene Gesserit program, a wild card. But yeah, so he's created an empire where there is no more exploring everything everybody's locked down uh it's all uh, you know and so he's he's his the ultimate point of this is to oppress humanity so much that you know when he's when he's gone they'll be like just explode out of this fucking cannon they'll be so excited to be out of time out you know out of out of daddy's grip they're just gonna go nuts <laughs> it's gonna go totally nuts uh we also learn about the 10-year festival that happens in the city of on from the fish speakers you have three representatives reps from each planetary garrison come um so that's a whole thing they send send three people from each deal and they, we also learn that leto is de-emphasizing the fish speakers as a military force we learn that the priesthood so remember in uh, the last Dune books, there's like this priesthood that grows up around Muad'Dib. The priesthood, they're lingering dregs from Dune religion times, but they're also just being devolved. You know, he's just like, just letting them die out. Uh, the breeding program, the Bene Gesserit have no idea what the fuck Leto is doing. And they are allowed a very limited breeding program of their own in which Leto monitors it. And he, the fish speakers, weed out any births that he objects to. So if they if he thinks they're doing anything funny, he's like, nope, fish speakers, you know, get rid of them. Uh, and also another interesting thing in this, and this calls back to his conversation with Mineo, where he's like, creativity is needed. Like if you want to survive the long term, you need to be able to like switch gears and like you need to be able to change your mind if, if you need to. Uh, the Bene Gesserit in this report say, we call your attention to the many instances where he has either lied or changed direction dramatically and without warning. And it's like, I've done that so many, I, I felt like, I was like, yes, like, I love doing that. <laughs> like, I will totally do that. Like, oh, we're going this way. Never mind. Never mind, guys. We're going this way. We're the thing you thought we were going that way, but now we're going this way. Um, they comment also upon economics. The Bene Gesserit are doubling their fees for schooling the great house females, and uh, their petition for more spice has been denied. 
However, their star jewel project with Chome is making some fat cash, which offset their losses on Giddy Prime. I love that they mentioned Giddy Prime and that like that was a loss. Remember when they were talking about, oh, there's there's a priestess, there's like a cult of Alia on Giddy Prime and Lido's like, boring, it's the Bene Gesserit and they're just using it as a cover while they look for a fucking spice hoard. Well, apparently that didn't work out for them. <laughs> so I love that that didn't work out for them. Um, the great houses are also dying out. They're dying a slow death over the past thousand years. 31 suffered economic disaster. Only six held on to house minor status and five were in on the Star Jewel project. I would love to know more about the Star Jewel project. It sounds really exciting. I would like in on this, on the Star Jewel project. Uh, family life, they comment on that. Everyone in the Imperium is well fed. Um, there's not like a lot of poverty going on, you know, Leto's piece, like everybody's doing pretty well. Daily life grows very static. Family life is similar on most planets. So like no matter what planet you're on, like the same thing is going on within the household. And they also mention hydraulic despotism. So if you control water, you control the people. Uh, and it doesn't have to just be water. It could be hydrocarbon fuels. It could be electricity. So, you know, say, you know, somebody took over the power grid, and then, you know, then you could control uh, a lot of people and like fuck shit up like really fast and like get them to like do stuff that you need them to do, which is really scary. Uh, Cause I was like reading this, I was like, oh, when, when is the, the electricity and the water gonna be turned off? You know, like when, are, oh gosh, that's gonna be crazy. Um, and they're, they're saying that Leto has built like a spice dependent empire. Like, and they're, they're even like, he might even, put a virus out there that'll fucking make it to where like you really have to have spice and like uh, and then you're really like fucking he's got you by the balls um then they also talk about the transport and guild uh, most people walk people are walking in this empire uh which is great for you i highly recommend walking walking is really good for you they have suspenser pallets so instead of driving a car they'll just have like a little a floating pallet that they'll walk along with in the air travels ornithopter and then there's the guild transport for interstellar travel and the fish speakers promote people walking because it's easier to control a populace that travels on foot yes it is and uh, the Bene Gesserit also mentioned the Ixian plot where they're like well we're partnered with Ix trying to like make a machine to where we won't have to need guild navigators then we can just go where we want and then you just know that it's bullshit so that was really funny uh, they also comment on the god emperor they say he's grown a bit does he have a water allergy? Is he using computers? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, we want, and then they say, we want sovereignty over our own breeding program. That's their number one thing. They just want their breeding program back. They just want it back so bad. Um, but they know that they're like, we do think that he's genuinely prescient. So we guide ourselves by the rule that we will not knowingly threaten his person or his grand plans. He, they say to him, tell us if we threaten you that we may desist Tell us of your grand plan so that we may help. And he's just not replied. He's like, I'm not telling you fucking bitches shit because I know you guys are so manipulative. Like I am gonna give you nothing, nothing, which I thought was really cute. Uh, they also talk about Queen Nuri being the new ambassador and uh, that she and her uncle Mulkey were possibly genetically designed for court. We talk about the Museum Fremen, how they're their in informants. So they have, they're paying the Museum Fremen, who also want more money. They still want, they got that souk mentality. They really want more money. And then the, and they're like, okay, fine, you know, because you're the only spies that we have. So we'll just, we'll just, whatever you want, dude. And then they talk about the Leilaxu. Uh, they say the new Duncan has not been tampered with. There is, uh, and that the, the Leilaxu. I love this. This is so funny. They offered a joint venture to create a totally female society without the need for males. They're like, hey, we'll work with you on creating some shit where like you don't need men anymore and you can just have your totally female society. And they're like, for all the obvious reasons, we were like, no, like they politely declined is what they said, but they're just like, ugh, gross. I would, we would never, we would never do that because that's the thing. The Bene Gesserit love dudes and they see that they need dudes and dudes are very balancing power and they're and they're wonderful. So I love that the Bene Gesserit, even though they love to manipulate dudes, they still love dudes and they don't want to get rid of them. So let's move on uh, to <laughs> chapter 13, the ultimate test. 
So our girl Nyla, back to our girl Nyla. She's Siona's, you know, if you remember her, she's our muscle lady fish speaker. She is a spy uh, from Lido on Siona. And she is climbing mad stairs to a secret meeting with Lido in his tower. This woman is described as having heroic patience and passionate simplicity. And she's such a precise creature that she stops at the same spot and rests every time she climbs the stairs to Lido's tower. Her strength is legendary within the fish speakers, and she has been known to lift a 220 pound man with one hand. One hand. She believes in Leto's godhood 100% and her, like 200%, and her devout faith in him makes her in many ways one of his most useful assistant ever. God tests, Nyla obeys. That is her thing. She will do whatever Leto says. And he tells her, even if Siona sends you to kill me, you must obey her in all things. She's like, I'll do it. Whatever you say, God, I'll do whatever you say. Because she's like, she's like, there's no way she could, I could kill him anyways. So I'll do it, you know, like, and it'll just, it'll just work in his favor. And he's given, he's given her a real Chris knife, although it's unfixed and it's going to like dissolve away, like by the end of her lifetime. Um, but he's given her a real Chris knife from Stilgar's household. And, uh, and I bet that in that meeting where you have Topri like waving his fake one around, I bet she's just like, I got a real one, bitch. Like, I, I bet she's just loving it. She's just loving that she's got a real one and they have a fake one because they're fucking fake. Um, and, uh, some think that I love this was this was uh, mentioned. Some think that the fish speakers are Leto's Bene Gesserit. He creates another religion, says the Bene Gesserit, and he says, "I have not created a religion. I am the religion." And he hates it. He hates it. He hates it so much. I have, he hates it so much. He says to Nyla, "I have created holy obscenity. This religion built around my person disgusts me. Disgusting." Um, and religion creates radicals and fanatics like you. And she's like, thank you, Lord. Of course. Like, thank you. She's such a simp. She's such a simp for God Emperor Leto. And the main reason he's called her up there is because he needs to hear her report on Siona to know if she's ready to be tested or not. Since she fades from his view, he really doesn't know. I mean, he's prescient. But Siona kind of fades in and out. So he really doesn't know if she's ready or not. So he needs Siona to like give him the 411. And she confirms it. And uh, although Siona's, again, she's also like, do you have to test Siona? Like the fish speakers really need her. And like if you kill her, you know, and he's just like, sorry. Uh, Siona is ready to be tested. And this is Leto's version. This is his Gom Jabbar. So let's move on to chapter 14. So we have Duncan. Duncan accepts command. Duncan finally meets his new Atreides master in a dark room off the hub of the crypt. Leto is waiting for him in the dark so he can speak with him and prepare the Duncan to see his gross warm body. And the thing is, he knows that this method works really well because he's done it a lot. <laughs> there have been so many Duncans. And this is one of the best ways to introduce himself to a Duncan. And, um, and the thing is, he's so... He's done this so much that he's even grown bored of the Duncans. And at one point, he ordered the Leilaxu not to make him anymore. There's just like, don't make me any more Duncans. I'm so fucking sick of these goddamn Duncans. But the Leilaxu were like, bitch, okay, whatever you say, we're going to make you another Duncan because we know you love those Duncans. And uh, they ignored him and they they made another one because they know that having a Duncan pleases the Paul Atreides in him. And so Duncan comes in and Leto first hits him with the Paul Atreides voice. And then Duncan hits back with, uh, how many are of me are there? And what's the deal with your sandworm body? And he explains to him that uh, it will make, my body will make a sandworm of sorts one day, but it will have more ganglia. It will be aware. So his, he will create, he will be the birth mother of a whole new generation of mutant sandworms and evolved sandworm who have some of his brain ganglia and that are aware how trippy is that and even after all this prep work duncan is still grossed out when he finally sees leto he's just like oh 
God, <laughs> he's so bummed. He's like, why? Like, oh no. And then he, uh, Duncan starts asking about the female army, um, which harkens back to the header of this chapter where it says uh, the fish speakers are a temporary army. While they can be violent and vicious, women are profoundly different from men in their dedication to battle. The cradle of Genesis ultimately predisposes them to behavior more protective of life since, you know, since they carry life in their bellies, they, while they can be crazy and fuck people up, they're like still like generally speaking a little bit more protective of life. And, uh, and I love the moment when Duncan blushes after Leto brings up the fish speakers having sex with Duncan when he first got on the planet. And uh, apparently the Duncans are among the few humans of these times who can still blush. I guess that we've evolved past blushing. We don't blush anymore when we're that far in the future, but he's still like, oh, and Leto's like, oh, it's so cute that you could do that. I thought that was adorable. Uh, then Leto goes back to work on him. He hits him with the Leto, the Paul's dad voice, Duke Leto voice. Then he hits him with the Jessica voice. Uh, and Duncan's like, whoa, that's going to take some getting used to. And Leto says, my own initial reaction, exactly. And then Duncan just cracks the fuck up at this joke. He just like laughs so hard. He's just like, whoa. And Leto, I love that Leto's bummed at how hard he laughs. He's like, that joke wasn't, that wasn't that funny. It's not that funny. This shit sucks. Like, don't laugh at me, bitch. Like, it's so funny. It's really, it is really funny. Uh, then he tells about Leto's peace. He, Leto tells him about the enforced tranquility in which the fish, fish speakers are the ultimate male enticing force using sex to subdue aggressive males to prevent or ameliorate excesses which could lead to more painful violence. So while the fish speakers will go in and they will kill motherfuckers 100%, they will fuck people up. They would rather just fuck them into submission, just like fuck the hate out of people, uh, which I mean, I just, I think that's such a great idea. <laughs> I was like, damn, that that really would work. I feel like that really would work in a lot of ways. But Idaho is still sus. He's like, mm, I don't know about this. I do not know about this. There's no more lands rad. There's no more self-rule. I don't like this God business. I don't like this manipulation through sex. Like, I don't like any of this. Uh, and I need to know that, or you need to know that I you know, will give you my loyalty to an Atreides, but I'm not going to go beyond the personal limits of my own morality, which is just classic Duncan. It's classic Duncan. He's like, if you're worse than the Harkonnens, I'll turn on you. I'll turn on you, motherfucker. And he's like, this, of course, you know, whatever. Like, uh, worse than the Harkonnens. Like, get out of here. He's like, I'm pregnant with my empire. I'll die giving birth to it. I'll die giving birth to it. Don't you talk to me. Uh, he's the ultimate androgene. And so Duncan finally says, all right, I'll accept the, to be the commander of your guard. He takes the job and he says, tell Paul and Leto, Duke Leto, use me well, for I did love you. So he's sus, but he's going to go for it. Now we get to the really fun chapter, chapter 15, an all-female army. This will be really fun to try to explain, and I you know, hope I don't get canceled over this. So... It's Duncan's first official day on the job. He's had bad sleep. He had nightmares of being swarmed by fanged women. <laughs> he's like really tripping on this female army. Like he's, he's tripping so hard that he's having fucking nightmares of like vampire ladies like swarming over him. And um, he's just like, he's like, God, like using sex as a persuader, like I just, I just don't know about it. And it's like, okay, so killing people is better? Like you think that killing people is better than just fucking the hate out of people like okay i mean whatever you know tomato tomato and his new quarters are built like a pleasure palace because the fish speakers really want to bang this duncan all the fish speakers they just want to bang the duncan uh and he's just like so put off by it maneo shows up to come eat breakfast and talk to duncan about his duties as commander and of course duncan again goes into how did my predecessor predecessor die and i love that maneo like gives him the truth without like giving him the truth he says he was not fast enough to escape the consequences of a decision he had made true and the rebellion killed him also true so you know that's very diplomatic of being able to speak the truth to someone while also still like holding back, uh, you know, holding it back. 
to some degree. The They have breakfast together. Uh, it's set in one minute. Again, the table and the chairs come from behind a wall panel. Uh, I, I Again, I, just, I love the like Frank Herbert, Isaiah, I love stuff. So I just love these books. I love that Frank Herbert really just wants to put, he's like, he's like the ultimate Ikea, like solution, space solutions person where like everything's like hidden and like just like, oh, we put this panel over here and then you can just pop out your table and chairs from the panel and then you can just set it up and then you can put it away and then you just have your room. Uh, I'm, I'm into that. I like that a lot. And, um, and they have a, a perfectly ripe, I brought some perfectly ripe Paradan melon, a fruit from Caladan. Duncan's favorite. He's like, oh man, they have this, they have this perfect, oh, this perfect fruit. He's just like, I love this fucking melon. Like, it's so good. And, um, Mene was like, yeah, I know. We know. We've had some practice. And they're drinking some coffee. They have, the, they have, speaking of Ikea, with my Ikea mug. They're having some coffee. They're having some melon together. And, um, again, Duncan brings up the all-female army question again. He's just like, I, I don't know, all-female army. He's like, I don't know, dude. And Maneo goes into explaining his, how Leto has explained it to him. Uh, and he is saying that Leto has said to him that an all-male army is too dangerous to civilian support base because when denied an external target, they turn against their own population because you're training all these dudes to like fuck shit up and go out there and kill people. And then if you don't have anyone for them to kill, well, you just created uh, killers who are going to kill. So it's like, what, what do you what do you do with them? You know, like, what do you do with them? And the whole thing is like, he's trying to have peace. He's not trying to constantly send people out and have wars and armies like he's trying to do that as little as possible. So he does not want to have that. Um, whereas with a female army, he's like, oh, well, uh, you know, go get married and have a kid and, like, you're done, you know? And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then it's over, you know? They're just like, oh, I'll go, I'll go be a mom now, you know? Like, I'll go do that instead. Um, and that's, and that's the thing that's, like, the big difference between a male army and a female army is that a male, like, women, they have the, the maiden mother crone thing in their lifetimes. So we start out as the maiden, and then we get our periods. And then there is the mother phase where, you know, you get pregnant. And that's here's the thing too, is like you get a period. So you're like definitely like, oh wow, like I am I'm a reproductive person now. And it's like this really big shift. You know, you go from being a kid to like being a woman, you know. And then and then, you know, if you get pregnant, it's like that's a huge that's a whole other new shift. That's a huge other new shift where you're like you grow this thing in your belly. It's nine months in there. You're feeding this life form. Uh, it's, it's growing inside you. Then you, you push it out. And then and you have this thing. You have this whole thing. And I mean, that's huge. Like, that's such a huge turning point. And, you're, and it's like really painful. And it's just like, it's crazy. And it changes you. It changes you when this happens. By the way, as of yesterday, I'm officially an aunt. I'm the weird aunt now. My sister had a baby. So I'm really excited. But anyways, uh, you know, back on topic. So, and then, you know, and then after that, it's like you have menopause where everything dries up and that's another huge shift, you know? So you have these shifts in your life where you're really like, I'm at a different stage. It, like, it's just like, I'm at a different stage. And the thing about it is like, dudes really don't have that as strong. Like men, I mean, yeah, you can, you can get it up and like, you can jerk off. But like, because there aren't these like major kind of like physical milestones in their lives, they're able to remain in a state of arrested development for much longer. Like they're not going to mature as fast or like have these definite demarcations of maturation in their life. And so because of that, an all male army becomes kind of this cult of youth. You have all these young men there. And then if they stay in the army, then like they continue on with this cult of youth and they have this very like adolescent kind of thing going on with each other where you know how guys are you know they like fuck with each other and they say like mean things to each other just to like to test each other and, and strengthen each other and um and also just like going into boot camp it's like oh boot camp is like hard and you go and you do that and then you have like then you you're mean to each other and then you go out and then you go kill other people you know and so and then also too the other thing about the all male army is that 
there's a thing there's a comes a point where something is so masculine that it becomes gay kind of like the movie commando i did a whole video about this where you know commando is supposed to be this ultimately super masculine arnold schwarzenegger movie and it's a hundred percent supposed to be like the most macho movie that it can be okay it's supposed to be the the ultimate macho movie but again, it, it crosses that line where it's so macho that it becomes homoerotic. It's totally homoerotic if you watch it. And the, the director has said, I did not intend any homoerotic subtext in this film. Like that was not the intention in any way, shape or form. But you can read it like that. It's so like, uh, like at the end, this one guy's got a knife and he's just uh, itching to penetrate you know john matrix with it and it's just and then he ends up getting penetrated there's a lot of penetration in the end of it i mean instead of fucking they're like killing each other but i mean it's 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 there and so he's saying that leto's like yeah so an all-male army like they get locked in the state of arrested development and then it's it becomes so macho that it gets kind of gay and then and then if it busts out of that when it busts out of this like this this thing that it becomes a rapist murderer which through history, you can look and see that when people were conquered by invaders or other people, whatever, a battle, the village got raped and pillaged. All the dudes would be murdered and the women would be raped. And that was like the big culmination of winning the the battle i mean like that's like all of england is like like they're they're products of like viking viking rape you know what i'm saying like if you go back and you look at the history of england it's like every time they were invaded and someone took over it's just like everybody gets raped like that's the whole thing and so he's just like i just i don't want you know i'm not trying to fuck with that so i want all female army that's why we're doing all female armies okay we're not we're not trying to promote any of that we don't want any of that i'm not saying it's bad i'm just saying that's not what I'm looking for in my empire. Uh, and, um, and then after they have this big discussion, uh, they talk about the breeding program. And again, Duncan is aghast. He's horrified to learn that the fish speakers were trying to breed with him because he did bang a bunch of fish speakers. And he's like, oh no, were they trying to get pregnant? And Rodeo's like, they don't use contraceptives. So yeah, like you may already have impregnated some people. And he's like, no, like he objects so heavy to being a stud. He will not be Leto's stud. I'm not gonna fuck people that you want me to fuck and breed with them. I'm not doing it. And then Maneo drops the bombshell on him. He's like, well, you're kind of my ancestor like i kind of came like you banged somebody and i'm here so like and and you may possibly father the de my descendants so he's already actively planting those seeds of that he's gonna bang siona um and Duncan's just like what what the fuck you know what leto doesn't believe in anything and maneo says you ask me what i think he believes in i think he believes in chance I think that that's his God, which I think is a really lovely way of saying, embrace the chaos. You know, Leto embraces the chaos. He loves surprises. He chances his God. He's all about it. So that wraps up our session two. For session three, you need to read pages 141 through 226. And that goes all the way to the, the precisely. Read until the last sentence of the last chapter is precisely. And uh, yeah, so thank you all for joining me for God Emperor Doom Club session two. So excited. Um, don't forget, if you're enjoying this class, you can support this channel when you join patreon.com slash danicaxix. Uh, and when you order merch through danicaxix.bigcartel.com. That's, uh, you know, those are some ways you can, you can do that. And we have a uh, God Emperor Dune pack available. You can get a little Dune Club keychain. And you can get a little Leto's Peace Enamel pen. And uh, it also comes with the reading schedule, a thank you card, and a signed God Empress bookmark 
So, yeah. And there, we also still have some spice melange lip balm in the house. So if you're looking for some spice melange CBD lip balm, it tastes amazing. Check it out. It's really great. You're going to love it. I use it all the time. It smells good. Tastes good. And it feels good on your lips. So, uh, and it's vegan. <laughs> So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, now we're going to continue on Twitch with our Q&A session. Thank you, uh, thank you, everyone. Goodbye.